Okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Pavel Djibovitsky. I'm a production engineer with Meta. And here with me, um, I'm Roman. I'm working for containers uh, team at Meta. And I'm Lalit, and I work on the layer four load balancing team at Meta. Today, uh, we are going to tell you an exciting story of uh, layer four load balancing and uh, direct server return evolution at Meta. This uh, network components evolved over the years, shaping the way we distribute traffic and um, ensure reliability of uh, Meta digital services. Uh, briefly, we'll talk about layer four load balancers and uh, improvement in the implementation. Um, challenges of uh, heavily stacked containerized environment we will be focusing on the direct server response uh, and um, key takeaways on the evolution path. And hope, hopefully we'll have some time for questions and answers too. Taylor follow advancers uh, distribute traffic among uh, backends, uh, making the decision based on the transport header, provide uh, high availability, scalability, and what is important, session persistence. Direct server return is one of this uh, method that is widely used in this world. Uh, in this case, the server uh, bypasses the loan balancer on the way back, responding dire directly to the client. It uh, greatly boosts uh, performance of the load balancer, especially in the web app environment when the response could be larger than the request itself. On the way to the server, the packets are encapsulated, wrapped, it means that we need to provide some something to unwrap them on the server side. Our original implementation was based on IPVS, which is widely used in the Linux world, but it uh, comes with a set of disadvantages. First of all, it's a CPU heavy. It was hard to collocate anything with a layer four load balancer. Another problem was uh, it's uh, too generic and it has to maintain uh, connection tables. Connection tables resulted in a bad performance when a large number of new connections is established, like uh, during DDoS attacks. And finally, it was a part of the Linux kernel. In order to deploy new features, uh, we need to deploy a new kernel version. Uh, we, need, we need something to move faster. When uh, BPF XDP technology emerged, a decision was made to uh, re-implement the load balancer uh, using this groundbreaking technology. The uh, XDP ability to run before expensive memory allocation is done uh, proved to be super CPU efficient. Uh, based on our uh, tests, we were able to handle three times more traffic, uh, consuming seven times less CPU. Now we are able to allocate other services with a layer for load balancer. Also, this uh, blood balancer became, became stateless. So DDoS attack was no longer a problem. And finally, uh, BPF uh, program release was isolated from the kernel release. We were able to push new features daily. Catran project was a great success. It was open sourced, it's available on a GitHub, and now on, we love with XDP. But what are the challenges of using XDP in production environment? Roman. Thank you. Yeah, so we discovered a couple of change, challenges with XDP in production. One of them was the fact that uh, there are multiple teams who want to attach uh, different XDP programs um, on the host. Um, some examples are like firewalls uh, that run on the host level or load balancing XDP programs. And um, those programs can be attached at different times and um, dynamically and they still uh, should have some um, expected order of execution. Um, and so to address these issues, uh, internally, uh, we um, built uh, XDP Chainer. Uh, so this program uh, was using um, BPF uh, dynamic extension program feature and it uh, published um, 20 different slots for other programs to attach. 
and it was sitting as an XDP program on the network device itself. Uh, so uh, for this program also guarantee that all uh, slots are executed sequentially in the same order. And um, each uh, program can uh, reserve, uh, or each team or the service can reserve the slot in advance in a static configuration. And also on the host, um, our container orchestration system makes sure that this XDP chainer is only attached to network device when there is at least one uh, slot is occupied. So in this diagram, you can see uh, the kernel space and user space view uh, for the XDP chainer. So in the kernel space, it's just go over the available slots sequentially, and each of the slot can return uh, the uh, actual like, uh, response, like XDP drop, pass, or redirect, which will be honored. And on the user space, um, uh, containers can actually uh, load, set priority, and attach programs to a specific slot that they reserved in advance. <clears throat> so with uh, XDP decapsulation, um, implementation, we saw some uh, minor performance gains, like about 5% soft IRQ CPU. It was also a simplified setup to attach XDP program uh, to, uh, to the XDP chainer on the host. And um, with XDP implementation, we also gained uh, statistics uh, published from the uh, kernel space by BPF program. And uh, the following diagram show <coughs> uh, the logic uh, around XDP decapsulation solution. So uh, you can see uh, that encapsulated packet um, went on a physical device, uh, network device, and it has XDP chainer. And one of the slots on this XDP chainer is um, allocated by XDP decapsulation program. Uh, so once um, uh, this program decapsulates the packet, uh, the host then route uh, this packet to the uh, correct container on the host, which serves this uh, specific DSR VIP. And uh, although we liked XDP approach, we also discovered a couple issues. Um, uh, in particular, security issue. Uh, the container itself needs um, elevated root access so it can uh, load and attach um, this XDP BPF program. And also there is an issue with uh, release cycle for XDP chainer itself. Uh, to uh, update the XDP chainer, we need to make sure that all slots are empty and basically the host should be drained for uh, to get the new version of XDP chainer. And <clears throat> also, um, we faced some additional challenges with uh, DSR decapsulation done on XDP level. So if we have two containers stacked on the same host that serve the same DSR VIP, uh, we will have issues and need additional work to actually route this uh, packet to the right container on the host. And Yes, uh, stacking multiple services on the same machine making our infrastructure super efficient. But in absence of the network isolation, it comes at the cost of uh, cross impact. There are a few categories of the cross impact. One is related to traffic black holes. Imagine that there is an application that was serving a VIP on shutdown, did, did not remove it. Something went wrong. This VIP would still attract host traffic, but nothing would serve it. It would be a traffic black hole. A similar problem can be caused by the routing table manipulation. Another problem, problem is related to security and accidental exposure to the internet. One service can be opened uh, has a VIP that opens through the firewall, and another on the same machine, if it listens to wildcard, it could be accidentally exposed to. It's a security risk. And finally, there is a performance impact. One service can open large number of sockets especially UDP sockets, and other services on the same host would suffer trying to find a source port for outgoing connection. 
It is why we love, like uh, love network room spaces that provide us uh, an isolation of the system resources related to networking. It's, uh, each container gets its own IPv4, IPv6 stack, routing table, uh, tables, set of uh, networking interfaces, including loopback. Uh, it allows multiple services to serve the same VIP without stepping on each other. Uh, it allows us uh, to configure firewall on the container level with rules more precise that could be configured on the host level. And finally, it resolves most of the cross-impact issues. But how can we plug it, them in in our infrastructure? Our initial approach was to reuse XDP decapsulation. In this case, the packet would come to the host, decapsulated uh, with a XDP program, and then would be redirected to the namespace that is serving VIP. But uh, it comes with some disadvantages. One that Arman mentioned, if two, container, two containers serve the same VIP, we have traffic, uh, we have routing ambiguity. Another problem that in order to forward, to redirect the packets, the orchestration system needs to be aware of the VIPs that are served in each container. And it did not allow us to create VIPs dynamically after containers started. We needed something else. Um, the solution came from the fact that actually each of the networking spaces has its own IP address. And this IP address can be known to the layer 4 load balancer. So the layer 4 load balancer can use it in the outer packet as a destination IP. What if we would allow the packets to enter the namespace, delay and decapsulation, and unwrap them in the networking space itself? How would we do it? So uh, since performance gain from the XDP decapsulation was minimal, we decided, okay, let's go back to the kernel modules. We implemented our pilot, and we realized that we have actually 8 to 10% latency increase for the services. What did we miss? In order to improve traceability, at some moment, we migrated from IP and IP to uh, generic XDP encapsulation. And now, uh, instead of uh, IP tunneling, we have like a full over UDP kernel model responsible for decapsulation. But uh, for you, uh, would not complete the decap. It would just strip UDP header and re-inject packet into the stack. Then there would be a tunneling driver to take care of the outer header, remove it and re-inject packet into the stack. And uh, this multiple travel through the stack resulted in increased latency on production load. It was good for the pilot, but we need something better. Well, Thank you, Pavel. Now to solve the latency issue of the full tunnel-based decapsulation approach, we needed a way to decapture the packet in a single pass, like the way we were doing in the XTP-based decapsulation approach. And to do that, we wrote a custom TCBPF decap program, which we attach at the V device of the container running in a network namespace. And when an encapsulated packet comes on the host, then it gets routed to the container whose IP matches with the destination IP of the encapsulated packet. And when this encapsulated packet reaches the V device of the container, it gets decapsulated by this TC decap program before moving up in the networking stack. We have this TC decap solution fully integrated in the container or orchestration framework. And by having this solution provided through container orchestration framework, services which need the solution can directly request it through container stack. And by having this solution provided through container orchestration framework, we can also remove some of the elevated privileges which was previously required to attach XTP-based DCAP solution. And this improves the overall security of the host. And during our early pilot testing of this TCD cap solution, we found the latency issue that we saw in the full tunnel based DCAP approach to went away in the TCD cap approach. And this is a great win for this TCD cap solution. We benchmark this TCD cap solution against XTP based DCAP approach, and we found the runtime of this TCD cap to be very close to the XTP based approach. 
In fact, the TCD caps uh, program was only around six nanoseconds lower, which is completely acceptable. Moreover, this TCD cap solution provides the same decap statistics that we had in the XTP based decap solution. And so, uh, in summary, this TCD cap solution provides all the benefit that we had in the XTP based solution, but it's at the same time, it also solves some of the issue that we had in the TCD cap approach. With the help of network namespaces, we uh, set up a isolated end-to-end -end test to test this TCD cap solution. And uh, more specifically, what we did is we set up a client in the outer, we set up our two network namespaces nested within each other, and we set up a client in the outer network namespace and server in the inner network namespace. And we attached the TC and cap program on the VT device of the client namespace and the TCD cap program on the VT device of the server namespace. And when the client sends a packet to the server, it get uncapped by the TC and cap program at the VT device of the client namespace with the destination IP of the uh, namespace of the server. And when, the, and, and when this encapsulated packet reaches the VT device of the server namespace, it get decapped by this TCD cap program before reaching ser the server. And when the server receives a packet, it responds to the client that it has received the packet. Since this TCD cap program is attached at the VT device of the network namespace, we initially thought that this would catch all the bugs. However, hardware matters. And we found out that different behavior exposed by different vendor can affect the working of the TCD cap program. And during our early testing of this TCD cap solution, we found two issue that was occurring on host running specific network device. For example, one issue we found was occurring on the host running Mallinox device. And in short, the issue was Mallinox by default enabled complete checksum. And when this TC decap program was trying to shrink the SK buff in order to remove the encapsulated part, then instead of computing the checksum from scratch, we just subtract the checksum of the encapsulated part from the total checksum. However, due to a bug in the TC VPF program, the NCAP header was modified just before the shrinking of the SK buff, which led to the incorrect checksum. And the second issue we found on the host where Broadcom device was running, and there the issue was SK buff didn't contain any bytes after the UDP header. However, we needed the first byte in the UDP header to be able to figure out one, what kind of encapsulated is done for this packet. The bottom line is that these kinds of issue are hard to mimic in testing and some bug would manifest on a specific hardware only. One way to catch those bugs would be to set up some kind of a synthetic end-to-end -end test where we have backends running different kind of network devices. Lastly, in the direct server return path of server, running in a network namespace enabled server, we have in slightly increased CPU utilization due to the increased software queue in the VT device. This is a well-known issue and has been addressed by Daniel at iSolvent uh, uh, with the NetKit device. We have tested this solution at our Meta Infra and we found the result to be promising and we will be implementing the solution so soon to resolve this issue. In closing, I want to say that e this eBPF technology have been extremely helpful in the evolution of layer four load balancing and DSR technology at Meta. Whenever we faced any issue, there was an eBPF solution that was available for us. Thank you very much. So uh, I think it's great that you talked about different hardware platforms you tested on. Uh, that's cool. We don't see that a ton, so that's good. Uh, one of the things I was curious about is lots of hardware can maybe not do automatic decap, but can do packet split. And we'll actually put all of the Geneve headers, for example, in should put it in the header and should put the data as only in data. Did you investigate whether or not it would be possible to have the hardware 
it doesn't solve one of your problems, but to have the hardware essentially split the packet for you after it was in cap to the load balancer and skip that totally that part of the BPF program. And it's okay if you didn't, I was just curious. It'd be an interesting to think about. It would save you one program from running. I think this is an interesting thing. We haven't investigated that. Yeah, okay. Be happy to help. <laughs> So you mentioned that you still have a performance gap of like 6% between XDP and TC. What, what's not the difference? Not 6%. Uh, the runtime was 6 nanosecond. Uh, the TC BPF program was 6 nanosecond slower than the XDP based. Program. Okay, but do you understand why? It's presumably you're doing the same decap um, at different points. I, one of, uh, I think the reason maybe that this TCD cap solution, TCBP program operates on a SK buff, which is a much larger data structure, whereas this XTP uh, program operates on a much smaller data structure. Like, so maybe that could be the reason. Yeah, I guess it's just weird that you're essentially still consuming the packet on the host. Yeah, just a random guess here. I, th I think it go back to earlier, like XDP. I think XD I remember XDP has some dispatcher to avoid the indirect call thing, but the DCPPF doesn't have it. It could be that six or one nine or something. Or, or maybe TCX is what is actually they need to, right? Because you're probably still using TC actions and filters and... Okay, thank you. I wonder whether it would help users if, I don't know whether NetDev sim is the right place or so, but like somehow to emulate, to have like an emulation for the different behaviors around the checksumming, right? Um, but uh, test prog, no? You can you like run the test prog and then you can provide all the geometries that we can think of and they can provide what the results should be and did yeah, you guys look yeah, at yeah. the BPF test prog um, as a way to test your program versus various geometries of SKB and various conditions? Not yet. Yeah, on the checksum thing, it's easy. We exhaustively test every possible checksum because we've had the same kind of similar bugs before and so the cases with like zero and all set. So in the case for them was that they, um, they have checksum complete, right? So when they attach to the XDP, the driver knew that there might be something funny going with checksum and it would disable checksum complete and go to checksum unnecessary. Okay. So the SKP metadata carries the checksum and the, the BPF program needs to be careful to readjust that checksum with whatever it's doing with the packet. So yeah. when you move from the XDP to the TC, the driver no longer does the magic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you mentioned with your XDP chainer that upgrades were hard because you had to like drain the whole server. Could you talk more about that? Yeah, so uh, XDP Chainer, so we only can attach at this time uh, only single program to the network device. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, to actually update this program, we need to make sure that all attached programs uh, in the slots, they detached in advance, just to avoid like any downtime for them, because okay. like it's like separate services or separate teams attaching their programs. Right. Oh, Martin, one more. Um, you have a question on the on your earlier slide. You mentioned there's a L port in use call is slow. Is that about a UDP? Then go go back to the earlier slide. You mentioned bef before you moving to the level M space, you have one thing that is slow. This one, UDP lib L port in use. So you you observe when you move to LNS, it, it helps. Okay. Yeah, before that, uh, it was a strobe light uh, uh, trace when uh, this function took 50% of the CPU of the process, for instance. It's, it's, it's heavy. All right, Stan, you want another one? 